안녕하세요. May I have your passport and arrival documents? Thank you. Your name is Duri An? Anduri, but Andrea Bianchi, officially. 혹시 어디 안시세요? I'm Italian. Who named it? Uh, Andre. I was a PhD student in KAIST. So the first semester when I joined my friends, they were trying to find a name to fit me. And then they decided to call me Durian. Actually, they asked me which name you like. And eventually Durian sounded good. It's similar to Andrea. So I stick with that. What do you think of students drinking ice americano? Oh, <laughs> uh, actually, I really like as well ice coffee and ice americano. I know, I'm Italian. Oh, I should know, yes. So in Italy, there are, I think, three Starbucks. One of them is basically in front of my house. So when I went there over the summer, every single day, ice americano. Oh, they do have americano? They do. And they also have it iced. So I got ice americano every single day in Italy. You're Korean. For that, yes. Do you have some experience in teaching students before coming to KAIST? Yes. I was actually a professor for a few years in Songgyungwan in the Swan campus. Why did you go to Songgyungwan? They, they offered me a job. So after graduating, Songgyungwan offered me a job and I thought it was a very good school. So I joined. Why did you leave KAIST and come back again? So I graduated from here. That means uh, I wasn't really expecting to come back because uh, usually it's difficult to come back as a professor. But I think I was lucky enough that after a few years, uh, somebody noticed my work and they thought maybe I could be a good fit here. So. They asked me to try to apply and see how it goes. <laughs> it worked well. You said you're trying to follow the four P's principles. Is it pen, pineapple, apple, pen? There is a, a book from MIT Media Lab and it's talking about the principle of that we should use for teaching and stay somehow children all the time learning. And those four P's are play, peers, passion, and uh, oh, there's one more. Uh, but those are the four P's okay, that anyways. I'm trying to follow. <laughs> um, please put your thumb right there. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, you have so many records. So it says you didn't realize how grades are important to students. And that is really a serious crime. Do you agree? Yeah, I do agree. I committed crime, will you deport me? Um, yeah, I think when teaching, the thing I face that I find most difficult is sometimes matching expectations. I come with my expectations of what probably students should be learning. And students come with their own expectations. And sometimes I think, oh, that's probably what they would like to learn. And then I figured out, well, they're half my age. And probably when I was 20, I had very different expectations from the expectation I have now. So sometimes trying to find that matching, including the importance of grades, it's a struggle and I forget about it. And I think that is what sometimes I struggle with teaching still now. So you still don't know what to do with the grades. I suggest, what about pass and fail? <laughs> Actually, I would love to do that. Oh, really? Yeah. To be honest, actually, these days, I shouldn't say, but I have a kind of a, I wouldn't call it a trick, but I'm trying not to grade as much as possible. And I ask TA to grade. Uh, and I think it's important because uh, by doing that, students perceive me as a, maybe a mentor. They can freely ask, knowing that my grade really won't matter that much because the majority of the grade actually comes from the TAs or peer review. So everybody give a grade to each other. What do you mean by shifting the student's attention from grades to something else? So that is an example, right? So if I don't grade them or if my grade count as much as anybody else in the class, what I do for them is not anymore being the grader, but maybe being somebody that's trying to help them do something. So I try to do that and that also remove the burdens from me of having to think about grading and then eventually to correct the grades because somebody is always unhappy with it. So I try to minimize that. Then, of course, at the end of the semester, I have to make a decision, but I try to make it based on all the grades that have been given through the semester, which I didn't necessarily give by myself, but a lot of people gave. So you're burdening the TAs? Yes, that's the best strategy. Burden the TA as much as possible and yeah. Okay. <laughs> Poor TAs. And then you over-prepared your courses. What is this? Sometimes I over-prepare my courses, so it's kind of silly. But for me, teaching is a little bit like theater. So it's a performance. It's not just PPTs. So I try to come very prepared with a lot of materials, a lot of examples, trying to keep in class activities to keep people's attention. So I feel very frustrated when people don't put attention. And maybe they don't put attention simply because they're tired and they were working on the assignments I gave them. But uh, 
for me, it's very important to have that kind of attention, like in a theater, where your audience is with you. So I feel frustrated when I don't get that. And I think the problem is this frustration comes from the fact that I put a lot of effort, so a lot of expectation, and I'm expecting the same amount of effort, but sometimes reasonably it cannot be given. And that gap causes a little bit of frustration in me. So you have some disappointments. Yeah, sometimes maybe <laughs> I'm perceived a little bit like a psycho. What's your definition of professional distance? Professional distance with students. You want to students to look at you as an example, but at the same time, you don't want to create a gap such that you are unapproachable. I try to spend a lot of time with students in my lab. So many times we have dinner together, lunch together, we do a lot of activities together. But when it comes to work, I always try to enforce the fact that we are lab mates. Eventually might not even like each other, but we have to collaborate. So business partners. Business partners. And then of course, the more time you spend together, the more it becomes family, right? Business and personal. You said if students are hungry and dinner is not ready, they must learn how to cook. Then are you starving the students? So I can't really claim I'm starving my students, but you know, what I feel is if you provide everything like uh, perfect slides, everything is clear, perfect activities and so on. There's really nothing else, no room for them to be curious and search by themselves what they want. So I think my role is to make them starve a little bit so that they will find maybe their own interest in that. As uh, Steve Jobs says, stay hungry, stay foolish. So I'm trying to <laughs> make them on diet a little bit. So you mean your lectures are not perfect? Uh, they're not perfect in, by any means, although I strive and I try and every year I modify them. And I think the fact that every year I modify them is because I know they're not perfect. So there was a good friend of mine, Song Yingwan, a professor in physics. Sometimes I told him, oh, I think I'm giving everybody perfect content, why they don't learn this? And he told me, it's not about teaching, it's about learning. So sometimes we focus on teaching well, but teaching is not the point. It's how much people learn. So I think that is the perspective that sometimes I have to remember. Do you have anything to declare for students? I can declare that I'm always striving to do my best and uh, try to push them as much as possible. Even if it might not look like I'm going the same direction sometimes, I try to do that in their best interest. I hope they can see that maybe eventually. Okay, you can go. Have a good time at Chris. Thank you. Thank you. So we give a kick to just have this with yeah. you, like, uh, uh, documents, yes. Uh, and then, do you have a Yes. 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 Yes